Very good morning, everyone. <laughs> seems like Nana just said, seems like everybody had too much porter wine last night, but hopefully you are um, awake to listen to these beautiful speakers we, had, uh, we have today. So thank you for being here um, to join our second plenary session of the conference. My name is Ajeng Larasati, and I work at LBHM. It's a community legal aid institute. We provide free legal aid services for people who use drugs, people facing the death penalty, and other marginalized groups. And we're based in Jakarta, Indonesia. It is my honor to chair this session titled Drugs and Beyond, Upholding Human Rights, an issue that is very dear to my heart, and I believe it is also dear in your heart. Ten years ago, when I first started my work on drug policy in Indonesia, drug policy was hardly seen as a human rights issue. Vice versa, human rights activists and communities were so allergic to the word drugs and drug policy. I know that Indonesia is behind in almost everything, but this situation, the misconnection between human rights and drug policy is also true in many other parts of the world. But today, it is virtually impossible to speak about drug policy without speaking about the rights of people who use drugs the rights of people who are affected by this failing drug policy. As we all have heard from many amazing speakers in the past one and a half day, drugs has become more and more visible as a human rights issue. We have been exposed to many flagrant human rights abuses conducted in the name of the drug war. In many parts of the world, thousands of people are put in jail for non-violent drug offenses. Hundreds of people were tortured, killed, and arrested for drug offenses. And countless are put in a forced treatment. In this session, we will hear from four speakers. All are leading experts and activists who have been pushing for justice and upholding human rights against the backdrop of the drug war. And I will introduce our first speaker, which is uh, Mr. Rodrigo Uprimni Yepes. Mr. Uprimni is a Colombian lawyer, currently the director of drug policy at the Center for the Study of Law, Justice, and Society, also called De Justicia. He is a professor at the National University of Colombia. He was a deputy justice for the Colombian Constitutional Court. He has written many articles on human rights, constitutional law, drug trafficking, and drug policy. Many of his articles I quoted on my thesis. He is also currently one of the members of the Committee on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. So without further ado, I invite Mr. Okuni. So, you don't have presentation, no? No. Okay. There will be time in the Okay. okay. Thank you, Ajeng. Uh, good morning to everyone. Uh, first, I want to thank uh, Ham Reduction International for this invitation. It's really an honor for me being here. And uh, I want to make a very small caveat. Uh, I'm not speaking here officially on behalf of the Committee on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, even if I think that most of the members of the committee share my position, but I'm speaking here on my personal capacity. What I'm going to deal in this very short presentation is the, about the potential of human rights law to achieve more human and democratic drug policies. I think we have here a huge potential, but an unexploited potential, because as Ajen said, there has been a kind of separation between human rights law and drug policy. For that, I will develop some uh, thesis some, uh, in order to, to, to make it uh, more clear. So if, if you want to put that li like a, a, the title of a picture in a cinema, it would be five theses and a final message. The first thesis is uh, very well known and is uh, a political one, and it's about the, the, the very negative impact of drug policy 
in human rights. Um, the thesis is very well known here, but it's not known outside conference like this one, so it's worth uh, reiterating it. And it's that drug policy, especially those policies based on a very punitive imp interpretation of drug convention, have been one of the most important drivers of massive human rights violation all over the world. Either because the drug policies in itself violates the rights, for instance, by establishing death penalty for nonviolent criminal offenses related to drugs. Either because in the wake of drug policies, uh, gross human rights violations are made, like the, the extrajudicial killings in Philippines. Or either because the indirect effects of prohibition uh, for instance, in Latin America, uh, uh, because of the creation of an illicit economy that fools mafias that have, have been threatening uh, our democratic states all over the, 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 the two or three uh, previous decades. So it's a very well-known thesis, but it, I think it's important to reiterate. The second one is related with what uh, our chair, Ayen, have just said. I, I, I said that one of the reasons why drug policy has full human rights violation all over the world is because there has been a strong separation between uh, human rights law and discussions on drug policy and discussion on drug convention. Uh, until very recently, if you were in a human rights venue on a human rights discussion, you wouldn't speak about drug policy. Uh, on, and on the other side, if, you're, if you were speaking about drug policy, you wouldn't speak about human rights. Uh, I call that in a metaphorical way a kind of Berlin Wall between Geneva and Vienna. In Vienna you discuss drug policy in the CND and in Geneva you have all the treaty bodies, the human rights treaty bodies. And in Geneva you wouldn't speak about drug policy and in Vienna you wouldn't speak about human rights. And that, and that, and that has gone for, for a, a, a lot of years. That's a very pessimistic view. Um, the more optimistic view, and that's my third thesis, is that, uh, as Bob Dylan would say, uh, times they are changing. Uh, this world has been, in a sense, destroyed. Now you have more connections, not strong connections, but more connections between drug policy and human rights law. These connections are going in the two sides. On, on the first side, on the, on the first side, uh, uh, those who discuss and have responsibilities in relation to, to drug policies are accepting that they have to fulfill human rights. Uh, the, the, the most important document in that respect, I would say, was the UNGAS document two years ago, uh, uh, three years ago, that that's really said that clearly, that uh, uh, drug policy should be developed within the framework of human rights. So now it's accepted, at least in theory, that uh, when, when you have to develop a drug policy, you have to make it in the framework of human rights, respecting human rights. That's the, the side in which uh, drug policies has beginning to accept that human rights is relevant for drug policy. But the second one, and I would say is the more interesting, maybe not the most important, but the more interesting is that treat, uh, human rights uh, treaty bodies and human rights uh, bodies has been more and more involved in drug policy in the last, I would say, five to ten years. It's a very recent development. And I would make uh, some, some uh, examples. The first example was a report made by the Office of the High Commissioner on Human Rights two or three years ago before the Human Rights Council about the negative impacts of drug policy in, hum in, the, full in the enjoyment of, 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 of human rights and the reforms that were, were necessary to be achieved in order to make in compliance with human rights uh, with the different drug policies. That was a very important uh, report. The second is that most treaty bodies, as you know, treaty bodies are uh, the committees in, in, the, in the framework of the United Nations that has the responsibility to monitor the, the implementation of different human rights treaties. In, in my case, I make part of the Committee on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights that has the duty to uh, uh, monitor the, the, the implementation by states of uh, the Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. Those committees have been more and more involved in uh, when, when, when they start 
study the reports of states on where they, uh, or, or when they make other statements to take into account drug policy as a factor that is very important in, in, in some violations of, of, human, of human rights. Uh, that, that has been the case of our committee, but that has been also the case of the Human Rights Committee in relation to death penalty of the Committee Against Torture that says that in certain cases, uh, for instance, uh, the, 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 the withdrawal of, of opioid substitution treatments is a kind of torture, etc. So many uh, treaty bodies have been involved in dealing with issues of uh, drug policy as a human rights issue. And that's very important. So, so that's that's the, our my third point. That that, that more and more there's a, there's a kind of of bridge between human rights law and drug policy. With that, I enter the the fourth point that it would be the the, the focus of, of of my last uh, minutes in this presentation is that that has a lot of potential. What, what I would defend is that the, this this kind of uh, if you want of effort of uh, trying to bring into drug policy uh, e human rights considerations and bring into uh, the human rights world the issue of drug policy has a lot of potential to uh, justify or, or, or to, to fight for more human uh, drug policy. And let me put uh, two examples that were discussed uh, uh, yesterday in, in, in some parts of the, of the debates that we dealt in the committee, in our committee. Uh, I can speak about that because these, these are official, now official documents. And this has to do with the revision that the committee made of, of, two, the con of two of the countries that has more serious uh, human rights uh, violation associated with drug policy, and I would say that's Philippines and Russia. And, and we have to study the cases of Philippines and Russia. And in our concluding observation, the concluding observation are the, if you want, the, the statements of fact and the recommendation that the committees makes when they revise the situation of a state. And in the concluding observations of, uh, in relation to, to Philippines in 2016, the committee expressed its, its condemnation of its concern about uh, the the, the declaration made by high-ranking officials in, in, relation, in the context of the so-called war on drugs that was seen as encouraging and legitimizing violence against drug use, including extrajudicial killings. And the committee reiterates that there was evidence that extrajudicial killings were increased, have increased in all those uh, uh, years. And the committee also was concerned about the criminalization of the possession and use of drugs that blocks a person in need of treating from receiving such, treating, such treatment. And the shortage of treatment centers that provide evidence-based health services such, op as, such as opioid substitution therapies. Uh, and with this uh, concern, then the committee made the recommendation uh, 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 for the state to stop any extrajudicial killings and to investigate these extrajudicial killings in order to bring into justice those responsible uh, of that. And the committee recommended, recommends the state to reconsider the criminalization of possession and use of drugs and adopt a right to health approach to drug abuse and harm, and harm reduction strategies, such as syringe exchange programs and increase the availability of treatment services that are evidence-based and respectful of the rights of drug users. So that's an example. We have other examples in the examination of the committee uh, of, of other cases. I cannot speak about the case of Russia because I, of limits of time, but it's very similar. It, that means that the things that were considered some years ago only as political discussions, very important political discussion, now they are also, besides being political discussion, they are also human rights issues that can be discussed before human rights treaty bodies. And that's my invitation, to, to bring to the world of human rights uh, all this uh, discussion about drug policy. Because if there had been a separation in, in the official spheres uh, uh, about, about drug policy discussion and human rights, I would say that in the world of, of in the civil society world, there had been the same separation. 
those who del deal with uh, issues of drug policy usually don't use human rights mechanisms in order to uh, uh, convey the message that drug policies have to change. And all those who are involved in, in, in human rights organization usually don't deal uh, about issues of drug policy. Though, so we need to, to, to make that bridge because that bridge has a lot of potential. But with that, I enter with my, with my last point, and, and that's uh, the limits of these strategies. I, I recommend uh, strongly to, to, to create this bridge and to use through the human rights law for drug policy discussion, but we have to accept that that has limits, that, that drug poli the, 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 the need to reform drug policy uh, is, uh, is uh, essentially a political discussion, a, a citizen discussion in which, 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 in which we have to be involved. But uh, in, that, in that discussion, uh, uh, human rights law can play a very important but limited role, a very important but limited role. And in that sense, I think what, uh, and that's the message of, of, of me as a Colombian, uh, I think that one of the most important um, links that we have to make is to put in contact the different persons that suffer about this irrational uh, drug policy that is prohibition that usually are not in contact. Uh, we are here in a harm reduction uh, conference and in that harm reduction conference, I'm sure that there are not uh, many persons that come from South countries that are involved in the other side of uh, 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 negative and, and effects of prohibition, for instance, as a, a, a person uh, who, who, who are involved in, illicit, in, 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 in cultivation of illicit crops, uh, like coca growers. Uh, and I think that as, as we have also separation between human rights policy, human rights law and drug policy, we have a separation about the discussion about harm reduction strategy in relation to people who use drugs and the need to have a kind of harm reduction strategy w w in relation to other people affected by drug policy. Uh, uh, in Colombia, uh, the people who are most suffering now about uh, uh, the implication of drug policy as, are those people who, uh, who, who, who are pushing for a reform of drug policy in relation, for instance, to illicit cultivation, in relation that we need al more alternative development programs than uh, aerial spraying or forced eradication. These are people that now are being killed in Colombia by people who uh, 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 want to defend again a kind of war on drugs or want to defend uh, the, the existence of these illicit crops. So my last message is we have to create a, a kind of solidarity between all the different uh, weak actors in, in relation in, in the whole chain of drug policy. Uh, and, and let me finish with, 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 with a personal example. Some 25 years ago, when I began to reflect on drug policy, I, I was already against prohibition, but only because of Colombia. Uh, I was in a country that was destroyed uh, in, 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 in part because of drug violence. And I said, uh, I said, in a sense, I don't care about people who use drugs. But we need to change this policy because if not, our countries are, are, are going to be destroyed. And I was invited to a conference in, 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 in Paris, and I met there people who were concerned about the effects of drug prohibition in relation who, with people who use drugs. And they said to me, I don't care about uh, if legalization is going to, uh, 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 to, to, to to, to, ha to have bad influence on Latin American countries because you are going to lose a lot of, of, of narco dollars. But we need to change this policy because of people who use drugs. And I said, we have a strong misunderstanding here. We are both in agreement that the effects of on the most vulnerable persons of drug policy are on both sides, but we still have to make a bridge between these both sides, uh, uh, between the impacts on the South of drug policies and in the impact on, on drug policies on people who use drugs. Thank you.